Good yantif. As a rabbi, I have the privilege of speaking with many of you at different moments of your lives. I talk with those of you who are about to get married and want advice about entering this new phase of life. Often you know you are on the cusp of change, but you aren't sure exactly what it will mean. You want to know what questions you should be asking at this momentous occasion. I spend a lot of time with our 13-year-olds as they study to become B mitzvah. Not surprisingly, Steph Curry and Taylor Swift have been the greatest connectors in talking to these teens. I also get to see these young people wrestle with what becoming B mitzvah means to them. Why be Jewish? What does it mean to become an adult at the age of 13? Am I doing this for me or for my family? I talk to those of you who have been diagnosed with illnesses, those of you who are pregnant, the wonderful group of you who love to study Torah every Saturday morning, those of you who decide to raise children alone, and those of you who enter the mikvah and become, became Jewish. In my short time as a rabbi, being with you across the journey of life has taught me something very important. Something that's also deeply embedded in the work we do today on Yom Kippur. No matter our age or our circumstances, we are called to continue learning. We are called to continue growing and we are called to continue asking questions. As we navigate the ocean we call life, as we move toward our destinations, we continuously enter new waters. It is upon us to keep asking questions about ourselves in our new surroundings. This may sound straightforward, but I found that it can be incredibly difficult. Even when we've done the hard work of growth, even when we arrive at a point in which we think we've figured things out, even when we gain knowledge of ourselves, life moves forward. The waters around us shift, and so must we. On Yom Kippur, this day in which we look inward and expose our imperfections, we are reminded that we all, at every point in life, have to reflect, learn, and evolve. We aren't given a break from Yom Kippur because this year, finally, we got it right. We aren't given a break when we reach a certain age or when we achieve a certain level of enlightenment. Some of us here today are 80-year-olds who have hard-earned wisdom, but we are entering a new life phase, life phase, and we have new questions about it. How do I learn to live in a changing body? What does it mean to enter a decade in which, my, in which many people slow down? What does it mean to lose some of my friends and family I spent decades with? What is my purpose now? Some of us are new parents, overjoyed and also terrified about the stage of life we are entering. How do I explain to my parents that baby powder is a thing of the past and that no, my six-month-old cannot sleep with an ancestral blanket because doctors now say that that is unsafe? And also, am I ready to raise another human being? Will I, will I have time to pursue my interests and keep up with friends when the baby comes? How do I figure out how to be my own kind of parent when I know very little about this fetus and all of these pressures are surrounding me? Some of us are 14-year-old boys. We've made it most of the way through middle school, but then our bodies grow six inches over the summer. This is very exciting and probably excellent for our basketball teams, but it also presents us with challenges. We have to adjust to navigating the world with a deeper voice and a different body. We have to learn what it means to navigate the world as someone seen not as a child, but as a teenager. Some of us are going through personal tragedies. Just when we feel we have recovered from the last of our losses and hurt, when we feel like we've done absolutely everything we can, here's life challenging us again. We ask ourselves, is this really happening to me? 
How do I get through to this? What does it mean to have all of this pain? Some of us are parents whose children have grown up faster than we thought possible. In addition to much quieter homes, we're facing one of the biggest steps in letting go of our children. How will my identity change? Will my kids be okay in college? What will I do when I miss them? Finally, some of us are not in an obvious life transition. Instead, we're living according to well-established routines. We also face questions. What were the choices that got me to this phase in life? How do I prevent myself from feeling stagnant? We hear the poet Mary Oliver's call, what do we plan to do with our one wild and precious life? We always live with attention. We are constantly changing and growing, but we also crave solid ground, self-knowledge, and confidence in our purpose. In my own life, there have been times, especially when I was in my late 20s, when I thought I had things figured out. I had worked through the angst and challenges of my teens and early 20s, and I thought I could relax and take my foot off the gas of self-reflection. I'll be honest, it felt pretty good. But as most graduate programs will do, rabbinical school taught me that I needed to keep growing. Early in my time in rabbinical school, Rabbi Andrea Weiss, the provost of Hebrew Union College, gave my entering class some simple advice. Have a journal and keep writing. Because of this writing practice, conversations I had, new experiences, and talk therapy, I realized how much I still have to learn, I still, how much I still had to learn about myself and about Judaism. Toward the end of rabbinical school, a prospective student in his 30s asked me what advice I had for people entering the program, and I told him, let rabbinical school change you. Even if you're in your second career and you think you have things figured out, it's important to keep growing. The realization I had about rabbinical school applies to the rest of life. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we have to allow our lives to evolve. Our tradition recognizes that the work of evolution, the work of learning, the work of asking ourselves questions never ceases. Every year, we come together for the month of Elul and the holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Even when we are successful at doing Teshuvah, even when we complete what Maimonides teaches us and we achieve the final stage of repentance, which is to act differently given the same situation, even if we do all of that, new challenges present themselves. We will move into different waters. We will make new mistakes. We will have to learn to grow in new ways. We will have to ask ourselves questions. In order to better understand why this can be so hard, we can look at how our forebearers designed one of the most important lives, one of the most important moments in many of our lives, our weddings. Interestingly, there are many themes that link a traditional Jewish wedding to Yom Kippur. One is asked to fast all day, one often wears a white shroud called a kittle, and one traditionally recites a confessional prayer, or a vidui. I once asked a wise teacher of mine, Rabbi Larry Hoffman, why the rabbis wanted to connect Yom Kippur to weddings. Rabbi Hoffman looked at me and said, on Yom Kippur, we rehearse our deaths, and when we get married, a part of us dies. Now don't worry, <laughs> when I officiate weddings, I don't lead with, this day is linked to your death, God forbid. Still, it is true that when we get married, part of us dies. For most, most folks who get married, our identities shift on our wedding day. We are creating a new family. As this new identity is born, the part of us that belonged to our old family of origin ceases to exist or changes. Other life phases are also like this. With ongoing change comes ongoing loss. 
when we turn 85, ourself as a 70-something-year-old who literally climbed mountains and traveled the world is sometimes only a memory. When my daughter is about to turn two, the small, cuddly baby who I could soothe to, soothe to sleep in our rocking chair is gone. Learning and growing ultimately mean letting go of who we are and the way we fit into our surroundings, which can be tempted, we can be tempted to clench onto what we think of as the current moment. We can be tempted to fight the loss that comes with moving forward. It can be difficult to accept that the present quickly becomes past, that every new milestone, every new situation, every new breath brings with it new questions. I believe that the book of Jonah, which we traditionally read on Yom Kippur afternoon, is all about the need to keep asking questions, to keep letting ourselves evolve. In the first verse of the story, we learn that Jonah is the son of Amitai, Amitai comes from the Hebrew word emet, which means truth. Throughout the story, Jonah holds tightly on to what he thinks is true. He believes that the people of Nineveh, the city, are stuck in their ways, and that there's no way they can repent truly. And so he flees his duty to become a prophet and sets sail on the ocean. His ocean soon becomes a storm. When he realizes he can't escape his destiny while he's in the belly of a giant fish, he does his duty and tells the people of Nineveh to repent. But to the very last line of the story, he remains obstinate and doesn't believe that the people of Nineveh could truly change. In fact, gripping onto the way he sees the world to the point of exhaustion leads Jonah to become miserable. Toward the end of the story, Jonah even asks God to kill him. Jonah's desire to remain the same and to fight change makes him so exasperated that he can't take it anymore. It's important to have compassion for how hard it is to journey through the changing waters of life. The demands on us to grow are never-ending, and this dynamic can be harsh. In Herman Melville's Moby Dick, we are presented with an extreme illustra illustration of this choice. Ahab is the sea captain, myopically focused on catching the white whale that bit off his leg. Abraham, sorry, Ahab is caught up with the grievances of the past and trapped in his static worldview. He offers an example of a dynamic that is at least true, partly true with all of us. Part of us is fixated on our past pain. Parts of us have not yet healed. When this metastasizes, we can become sick with bitter stubbornness. In contrast, Ishmael, the narrator of Moby Dick, allows himself to grow. Out on the great sea of life, Ishmael's views change. He moves from Puritanism to pantheism, he evolves. As one literary scholar put it, Ishmael learns to savor moments of peace and transcendence rather than searching obsessively for fixed belief. I've personally found that the best ways to continue growing are to, ve to develop a practice of journaling, to find a group of folks going through a similar phase in life, to do talk therapy, and to be open with friends and family about what's going on in your life. I've personally been inspired by my mother-in-law who is in her 80s, and she's committed to a life of ongoing growth and learning. She sees herself as a lifelong learner, and that is borne out by how she reads new books, learns about new schools of thought, and sees herself as still becoming. In my short time as a rabbi, I've seen so many of you navigate life with openness to change and by continuing to ask questions. I've heard single folks talk with pride about navigating life independently, about the growth they've done on their own. I've been with folks in their 80s, 90s, and 100s who share from the heart about the changes they're facing, about how they're entering a new life phase. I've been in the room when engaged couples read beautiful love letters to one another, letters that are moving not only because the two are in love, but because they have this incredible insight into how they want to let each other grow and change. I've sat with folks facing a cancer diagnosis, 
people who slowly, gracefully accept the challenges and scariness before them and treat it all as a learning and growing experience. I've seen people navigate the difficulties of divorce with an acknowledgement of the changing moment they are in and an openness to letting go and moving forward. We are always becoming. It is upon everyone at every point in life to continue growing, to continue asking questions. Until we take our last breaths, our neurons form new connections. It is upon us to steer ourselves forward. In fact, I would go so far as to say the effort to not grow, the attempt to keep things the same, is itself a form of change. When we grip too tightly to the present, our clenched fist calcifies. It becomes its own, less healthy version of change. Ultimately, continuing our growth requires that we remain humble. We are called again and again to accept that we don't have it all figured out, that we need to keep learning. Growth asks us to be able to imagine and to trust. We are asked to imagine new versions of ourselves, and we are asked to trust that by asking ourselves questions, by continuing to process and to be introspective, we can be better, healthier versions of ourselves. If we do this work, if we are able to keep an open mind and continue to ask ourselves questions, we can find joy and fulfillment as we grow. This is challenging, but it's also incredibly rewarding. The tides of life are always in motion. We can face this with dread, or we can face this with inspiration. In 5785, let's continue to grow. Gamar Hatima Tobah.